You're listening to the Churchosity Podcast, where we talk about the Gen X take on church culture. I've got a bad feeling about this. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Churchosity Podcast. My name is Heath Brady, and I am your host. My name is Andrea Brady, and I'm your co-host. We're just a couple of Gen Xers doing the very best that we can at giving our perspective on church culture. And this podcast is dedicated to the Gen X Christians. You know, the ones that just want to keep it simple. The ones who just want to live quiet, peaceable lives. We represent the generation of Christians who sometimes looks at what others are doing and thinks, whatever. whatever. But as it says in 1 Timothy 1.5, The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and from a good conscience and from a sincere faith. So Andy? Yes? How's it going? <laughs> going good yeah anything new in the hood anything new in the hood not really we had a lot of dogs barking the other day yeah what was up with that i don't know i was like is are we gonna have an earthquake I know, right what's happening because it's like every dog in the neighborhood was just howling and barking all day long except ours yeah ours were pretty pretty calm that's because we're good animal parents <laughs> yeah we're good animal parents. Yeah, we're good animal parents. <laughs> well, you know, I did something from out of left field recently. What? I watched a movie that I have not watched in a very, very long time. What was it? And I'm pretty sure that if by chance you've seen this movie, you've only ever seen it one time. Hmm. The Terminator. Oh. The original Terminator Can movie. Can you believe I haven't seen Terminator? I'm not. I mean, I'm not surprised because you know I, I've it's seen not the really. In, it's not a real. It's not a movie that's really in your wheelhouse. Well, I've seen the Predator movies. Totally different genre. Okay, same actor. <laughs> <laughs> and and same dialogue. Yeah. I'll be back. Yeah. That's funny. Well, I mean, I probably like them if I watch them, but I just wasn't into it when they came out. Yeah, it's it's science fiction. It's it's not one of your forte tastes of movie genres. Mm-hmm. It's one of mine. Yeah, I, I remember this movie. I think it came out, I want to say like 86, 87, somewhere in there. Hmm. And, uh, you know, there there's a lot. If you, if you look on like Amazon Prime and Netflix... And I think maybe even on Paramount Plus, you'll see all of the Terminator movies that there are. And recently, I was reading an article about how the most recent Terminator movie in the franchise basically killed the franchise. And uh, <laughs> it's 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 really is not a good movie. It's, Interesting. It's it's very nostalgic because they bring back Linda Hamilton's character for one last time, but. Uh, she was the original Sarah Connor from Terminator movies. Okay. So, yeah, I, I thought, you know what? I haven't seen this movie in a really long time. Mm. And so I watched it, and there was a lot in that movie that I forgot about. And, you know, looking at the special effects from circa 1987 compared to today, it was really, <laughs> really terrible. Was it really? <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of motion capture and mm. claymation and, you know, blue screens and whatever. But I remember when I saw the movie in real time, like when it actually came out back in the day, mm -hmm. I remember everybody talking about how unique of a film it was because it was a concept that had never, like, been played around with in... Hollywood in, in movies. Which was? That, well, I mean, it's it, it deals with the future. Mm -hmm. And um, the basic premise of the movie is that somewhere in the future, in the early 21st century, artificial intelligence becomes self-aware. Okay. And wages war on humanity. 
and they end up like launching nuclear missiles and everybody on earth is everyone like like two-thirds of the world is killed in nuclear holocaust oh okay and the humans who survive Yikes. are basically imprisoned or hunted down by the machines mm -hmm. well in the future there is a there's a renegade soldier whose name is john connor who leads a resistance that destroys the machines and so the machines thinking that they're all wise send a terminator back in time to kill john's mother who is sarah connor oh okay so that he will never be born so that he would never be born okay right? yeah i think i've i yeah i'm kind of aware of the concept now that you're walking me through it yeah so i just you know i'm watching i'm re-watching this movie for mm. the first time in probably i don't know 30 years 20 years i don't know and i'm watching it like with a new set of eyes mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, even way back then, the world had this obsession with knowing the future yeah, or being able to predict things in the future. Like mm. think about like you can even think of like the Star Wars franchise, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't so much in the original trilogy, episodes four, five and six, but in the prequels, of course, we already knew who Anakin was. Yeah. But there's this whole concept with the Jedi Council knowing this prophecy. Okay. That there would be the one who would bring balance to the universe. Mm -hmm. Right? And then, you know, Yoda's infamous line, perhaps misread the prophecy we have. Because <laughs> Anakin ends up breaking bad. Right. It wasn't Anakin. It was Luke. Right? Well, no. Anakin was the one that brought balance to the force, but he brought balance by shifting to the dark side. Oh, weird. Yeah. So anyway, there was, th <laughs> there was this, obs oh, so yeah, but there was okay. this obsession with knowing the future mm -hmm. that someone was going to come to fix everything hmm. or think about the matrix movies. We've talked about them already plenty on our show, right? but you know, Neo is the one. Right, the one. Who would overthrow the machines, mm -hmm. right? And it's like there was this period of time, and I think we're finally coming out of it, where in Hollywood there was this obsession with post-apocalyptic, dystopian, like global destruction type of movies. Yeah. And some sort of prophecy that spoke of that one person who would fix everything. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I don't think that theme is ever going away anytime soon. No, because I think that <laughs> I think that humanity, whether they choose to admit it or not, mm -hmm. is worried about the future. Yeah. And uh, you know, wink wink, looking for a savior. Yeah. It's interesting, don't you think? Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, they're even messing with this in the superhero movies. It seems like whether it's DC or Marvel, whether it's in the movies or on television, these superhero themed productions deal with the multiverse and messing with the time continuum and having that one person like Doctor Strange mm -hmm. who sees like 11.87 11, 11 million different outcomes and only one is the possibility of the Avengers winning. I mean, there's like this obsession everywhere you look. Yeah. With humanity's impending doom mm -hmm. and someone looking for someone to rescue or save or preserve people, you know, through the whole thing. Hmm, it's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. And so as I, this last week, have been pondering all of these things, you and I had a conversation about something new that we want to bring to the podcast. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to introduce on this episode a segment that will appear in future episodes of our podcast that is called This Week's Proof That We're Living in the Last Days. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. 
And so on this episode, we want to talk about all the different ways that we think whether serious or sarcastic. <laughs> you know me, I'm mostly sarcastic. <laughs> that could be proof that we're living in the last days. I would like to preface this conversation with some scripture. All right. Which is usually a good place to start, don't you think? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We love the Apostle Paul. Love him. And he writes some very, very interesting words to his protege, Timothy, in both the first and second letters of Timothy. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, Paul writes, But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, Mm. revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Now that's a pretty brutal list Wow. That Paul gives to describe the condition of humanity in the last days. Mm-hmm. And Andy? Yeah. For our listeners, <laughs> would you like to unpack just briefly what we mean when we talk about the last days? Well, we're talking about, you know, the time leading up to Christ's return. Exactly. That it's getting closer and closer. Right. In the book of Matthew, when Jesus was explaining to his disciples that even though he was going to go away, that he would return, and he gave signs. He told them that there were signs that would be pointing towards his return. One of the things that he said to his disciples was that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man returns. So then, obviously, you want to go back and look in Genesis 6 and 7 and find out what things were like back in the days of Noah. Oh, man. Well, when you go back (laughs) and read in Genesis chapter 6, you find some rather interesting things about just, in fact, what life was like on the earth during the days of Noah. In Genesis chapter 6, beginning in verse 5, it says that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great upon the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Mm. So when Jesus is talking about what things are going to be like when he returns, he's talking about this period of time. And when you couple that with what Paul says to Timothy about the way things are going to be during the last days, and he describes what the human condition is going to look like, Yeah, I see a serious parallel there. Right. Because if the heart and mind of humanity is to do evil continuously, you're going to be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, etc. <laughs> I don't think that we have to look too far on the horizon to see what we're talking about here. Right. We'll just turn on the TV. (laughs) Just get in the car and drive around town. Right. You know, what are some examples, Andy, that you can think of that would be proof that we might be living in the last days right now? (laughs) Well, let's see. Hmm. And they can be serious or they can be sarcastic, but... (laughs) Well, I don't know. Sometimes, you know, when I was growing up, my grandparents or whatever would say something like, what's this world coming to (laughs) when they're watching the news? (laughs) Or if they're if they turn on the TV and, you know, maybe they accidentally turned on MTV and watched saw some music videos. (laughs) What's this world coming to? (laughs) 
Oh gosh! And back then, <laughs> back then the videos were quote unquote clean. They were. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm you know racking my brain. Let's say let's only go back maybe a few years. Okay. Um, when the Notre Dame in Paris burned down, mm. I was like, "This is it. The end is near." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, besides like the Vatican or some other, I, that's like one of the biggest Christian churches that's iconic in the world and it burned down and it's been there since like, I don't know, the 1400s maybe. I mean, it's just been there forever. And, uh, and we've been there and we've been there. And I saw it when we saw it burning on the news. I was just like, really sad. You and I cried really hard. Yeah, and I just, <laughs> I thought, oh no, the end is near. What else is gonna happen? Mm. And that was in uh, 2019, actually. <laughs> Has it been that long already? Yeah, it was uh, March 15th, or no, no, April 15th, 2019. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Boy, the last two years of COVID have really like made time just dance by so quickly haven't they yeah and then i think when billy graham passed away that was definitely like he was such an icon and you know one of the last great of you know evangelists i guess yeah it's weird to think that billy graham has gone home to be with the lord yeah like that's somebody that you thought was going to live to be older than moses i know i know <laughs> that was in 2018 Wow. So we had Billy Graham pass away in 2018, and then Notre Dame burned in 2019. Oh, my goodness. And then COVID <laughs> in 2020, <laughs> followed by murder hornets. <laughs> <laughs> and in the midst of all of that, you had Donald Trump as the president of the United States of America. Right. Who would have thought? Right. Yeah, you know, I have to tell you, there are, there are some events that have happened over the last few years in the church that are staggering to me. That if I was to say that might be proof that we're living in the last days, they definitely kind of pricked my ears a little. Oh? Like when John MacArthur lashed out about Beth Moore Ooh. and that whole complementarian upheaval in the church. Yeah. And this mass like exodus from following John MacArthur began mm -hmm. to happen. Yeah. I never in my wildest dreams, first of all, ever imagined that John MacArthur would ever say something like what he said about Beth Moore. But I never in a million years imagined that there would be a mass departing from following John MacArthur. Right. I used to love John MacArthur. I've said that before. I used to listen to his sermons online on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. I've read many of his books. Theologically, I think that for the most part, I would agree with just about everything, at least in his primary theology. Yeah. But I never in my wildest dreams ever imagined that the church would have like a schism happen. <laughs> with people turning their back on all things John MacArthur. That was a trip to me. Yeah. It really, really was. The whole thing with Mars Hill. Oh, yeah. That with, was big. That with was a Driscoll big and, and all that stuff. Yeah. And the fact that he, just a couple, of, less than two years after abandoning the church that he had basically destroyed in mm -hmm. Seattle mm -hmm. and starting a new church in Arizona and the fact that that's thriving... Mm -hmm. And that he's turned his back completely on the theology that he held when he planted and built the Mars Hill Church. That's pretty... And he swung in the other direction. <laughs> that's a little different. Yeah. That's uh, kind of crazy. Yeah. You see stuff like that and you kind of scratch your head and you go, you know... How authentic was it in the first place? Yeah. That's yeah. kind of like all the dogs in the neighborhood barking except for mine. <laughs> Something weird's going on. Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. Absolutely. <laughs> little homage to Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. Nice one, my love. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I have to say that as an American, 
as an evangelical American, mm -hmm. it was really exciting to see what I thought, what I perceived as a major turn in American culture when Barack Obama became our first black president. Mm. We're not I, getting into politics now, are we're we? We're not. No, 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 no. We don't talk politics. Just bear with me, okay. listeners of Churchosity. Oh, okay. Bear with me, co-host. <laughs> I just kind of felt like there was this global universal celebration that the United States of America had finally, at least in some regard, gotten over itself by electing its first black president mm. for two consecutive terms. Mm-hmm. And then immediately after that, there was the golden opportunity for the glass ceiling to shatter. Oh, okay. And Hillary Clinton, who could have been America's first woman president, lost to Donald Trump. Yeah, well. That's definitely proof that we're living in the last days. <laughs> I think that America is overdue for needing a good spanking from a mommy. True. Well, I've got some proof that we're living in the last days. Lay it on me. The Jeep Gladiator. What? I'm sorry. I hate it, and I think it's ugly. <laughs> oh, is that is that the model of the Jeep that is actually a truck? Yes. Oh, come on, people. No, I really hate it, especially the four-door model, and it's. I was just the first time I ever saw it. I just was like, what the heck is that? I thought somebody had custom done, custom made it. And then I saw more than one around and I thought, this is not happening. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a motorhead by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> but even I knew when I saw the first one of those on the road, yeah. that was either some illegal import from another country. <laughs> somebody made that like from a chop shop. Mm-hmm. Or that we're living in the last day. <laughs> I've got another one. Benifer is back. Oh gosh, you went there. <laughs> if you didn't see them together at the Super Bowl, wasn't that just like cringeworthy? Let me break the news to you that Ben Affleck and J Lo are back together. Wow! After all these years. I think they broke up in 2004. I don't even know. And I had to Google it. That's they broke up in 2004. <laughs> that's embarrassing for even me because I like to pride myself, unfortunately, on having my finger on the pulse of the celebrity culture. <laughs> and even I don't remember when that happened. Well, when I saw them together, I was just kind of like, Bleh. I don't know. Gag me with a spoon. We're kind of like that when we see most celebrities together, though. <laughs> Gag me with a pitchfork. Gag me with a pitchfork. <laughs> like, totally gross. Yeah. As if. <laughs> what else you got? Tiger King. What about Tiger King? The Not only did it have the first season, which was an abomination, but they had came out with a second season, and now... They're coming out with a prequel. A series. A TV series. Yep. It's going to be on Peacock and it's called Joe versus Carol. <sighs> I know. It's a it's a horrible. I can't. I have to confess that I watched the first season during COVID. Everybody did. Everybody was Because there wasn't anything it. else to do. We were all locked I up. I know. I did. I watched it. If there's any, if there's any proof needed... That we're living in the last days. It's that I watched it. <laughs> yes, it's that you watched Tiger King. I know. I feel so bad. But really... wouldn't couldn't uh, couldn't we at least agree that that show was kind of like a horrible fifty-two car pileup on the interstate? Pretty much. That you just couldn't not look at it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everyone was talking about it and wearing animal prints. And we wanted to be cool. <laughs> I wanted to know what was going on. Yeah, we had to be in the know. I did. I had to be in the know. And sometimes you just wish you didn't look. I think that it's kind of cringeworthy that we have so many divisions happening within church, within the church culture. Yeah. You know, we have, I mean, fundamentalism. We talk about that a lot mm -hmm. previously. Christian nationalism. We've mm -hmm. talked about that a lot previously. Yeah. Exvangelicalism. 
which is the whole deconstruction movement, people leaving evangelicalism altogether. Mm -hmm. In some ways to me, it feels like we jumped in a time capsule and went back in time about, I don't know, 800 years or so, (laughs) back into the dark ages or something, because we have church fighting against church. You know, there's all of these new factions and... Um, we've talked about it on a previous episode about how if somebody isn't in your camp of evangelical Christianity, then they're like anathema to you Mm -hmm. and vice versa. You know, it's like we've become our own worst enemy in the church over secondary and tertiary issues. And it's baffling to me how the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is supposed to not only save, but also unite us together as the body of Christ, is actually the thing that's being used to divide us. Yeah. Or the way that we practice our worship on the Lord's Day, or the music that we listen to, or whether we're pre, post, mid, or all millennial, or you know whatever it might be if we believe in vaccinations or not getting vaccinations if we believe in mask mandates or no mask mandates Mm -hmm. if we if we think that covid is legit and we should trust the science or if we think that covid is make-believe and we're all a bunch of sheep right you know fill in the blank Mm -hmm. and again we're talking about what's going on in the church yeah, it's all a distraction. I mean, that everything that I just said really echoes to me the church's role mm-hmm. in being lovers of self mm-hmm. and arrogant and revilers and unholy and unloving and irreconcilable and even malicious gossips. I mean, it seems like people are just like running around over the top excited to hurt one another in the church because of a disagreement, a differing opinion. Exactly. A a different way of doing your worship service on the Lord's Day in your church. And on the contrary, in Colossians chapter 3, Paul writes, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, Mm. bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Wow. Yeah, I don't see very much of that. I see a lot more of the opposite of that. (laughs) I know. And that's proof we're living in the last days. Yeah, for sure. Because when God's people can't find a way to get along with one another. Yeah. That's a that's kind of a bad omen. Right. Yeah. When we're warring with one another. The homeless crisis. You realize there's over a half a million people in the United States that are homeless. We could have a really long conversation. We could do an episode on that. Yeah, we could. But for the sake of this conversation, mm-hmm. what about the homelessness in America makes you feel like it's a it's proof that we're living in the last days? Well, a lot of those people that are homeless are lost um, in that they're mentally ill or addicted to substances or they've lost their jobs and they don't know where to go or what to do or who to turn to or and I just think that a lot of us who are the haves and not the have-nots kind of a lot of people harden their hearts and don't want to look at it anymore right because there's so many people that are out there You know, if you're living in a major metropolitan city, I mean, there are a lot of people that are living in parks and on the sidewalks. Mm. It's a big problem in all of the major cities. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that when we become desensitized 
and when we we lose our compassion for people, that's proof we're living in the last days. I would agree. That's kind of right up there with the way that, in a general sense, Americans react to another form of gun violence that happens somewhere, like if there's a shooting or something. Mm. It's like, oh yeah, that's... Another shooting. Another shooting. Yeah. Yeah. It's really hard to, as a Christian, try to remain compassionate and um, approach these social issues with grace and, you know, and, and love. Yeah. As Christ would. It's very hard to do. Yeah, that's true. It can be. I know something really crazy that happened recently in what? the last couple of years. What? Prince Harry and Meghan Markle left the royal family. Oh, yes. That was crazy. How does that work? I have no idea. <laughs> and as a side note, <laughs> further proof yeah. that we're living in the last days, hmm. you got me to fall in love with The Crown <laughs> and Downton Abbey. Yeah. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Definite proof that we're living in the last days. How about um, Kobe Bryant dying in the helicopter mm. crash? Yeah, that was a big That deal. was devastating. Was shocking. Yeah, absolutely devastating. Yeah, you know, there was a lot of... There was a lot of very important and influential people that passed away in 2020. Not oh, just Kobe were. Bryant. Yeah, there were. But you had like... Chadwick Boseman, the guy who played Black Panther, yep. he passed away. The infamous Ruth Bader Ginsburg, mm-hmm. she passed away. Eddie Van Halen, us Gen Xers, like mourned to to hear that Eddie Van Halen had passed away. Isn't that crazy? That is absolutely crazy. Like Alex Trebek passed away. Yeah. Like, these are people that, like, we, Andy, you and I are now at the age where our heroes and our icons are, are dying. I know. It's crazy. That's proof that we're living in the last days because all of the coolest people that ever walked the face of the earth (laughs) are leaving us. (laughs) That's so true. Well, and as a side note, Madonna can collect a social security check now. Oh, that's gross. <laughs> I mean, it is. She's now 63. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> I mean, it isn't enough that the oldest child is 30 now, mm-hmm. making me feel old. But Madonna's 63. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, we're definitely living in the last days. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sean Connery passed away. Oh, man. In 2020. That's right. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And again, I know that we don't like to talk about politics, but the way that these last two presidential elections have gone, it just seems like we've gone so far away from your vote counts to your vote has to be recounted 87 times. (laughs) Right? It makes me think that every election from now on is going to be contested in some way or another. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if we see declines in the voters' booths <laughs> in elections to come. Right. I mean, it's it's staggering to me how with all of the technology that that has advanced that we have this kind of problem. But I know it all it's like hackers or whatever or rumors of hackers and all that stuff. Yeah. You know, but it's like oh my goodness, you know, like when you when when you can't really rely on the system that's in place that essentially is the foundation of our democracy, mm-hmm. that's proof that we're living in the last days. Yeah, wasn't it in uh, the election where um, Al Gore lost to Bush? Oh, the two thousand election, With the dangling chads, the dangling chads of Dade County, <laughs> Florida. Yeah. Yeah. I know that was over 20 years ago, but um, that might have been the beginning of proof that we're living in the last days. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Because it was just barely a year later that 9-11 happened. Mm. Yeah, but we won't talk about that. No. It did change the world. Definitely did. Mostly for the worse. 
Yeah. I mean, we could talk about the the raid on the Capitol building on January 6th of 2021. Mm. That was pretty incredible that civilians could do that. In light of all of these things that we've brought up, some of them in jest, some of them serious, but all of them with the intent of pointing into the direction that we are, in fact, most likely, probably living in the last days. Yeah. Looking for proof. Well, we're closer to the last days than ever before. That's right. We're one day closer <laughs> to the end, right? Yeah. <laughs> but there is some light at the end of the tunnel. Yes. There is some hope at the end of the rainbow. There is. First of all, all of us are on a level playing field when it comes to figuring out whether or not we're in the last days. Because yeah. Jesus said nobody really knows. That's the truth. Yeah. But the other thing is, especially if you are a Christian, if you name the name of Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then whether we're living in the last days or not, but especially if we are in fact living in the last days, Jesus is your hope. Mm -hmm. And that if these are the last days, we're very close to his return. Well, that can be exciting. Yeah. And that's going to be greater and more exciting and more joyous and more earth shattering than any of the good, bad, or strange things that have happened over the last several years in this country, all over the world, wherever or whenever they happened, even if they might in fact be proof that we are living in the last days. And that's all we have to say about that. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Churchosity Podcast, the show where we try to give you the Gen X take on church culture. And thank you once again to my amazing co-host. Ah, uh, you're welcome. Be sure to follow us on all the socials. That's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Our handle is at Churchosity Pod. Drop us a message and give us your feedback because we'd really love to hear from you. And if you might just so happen to be listening to this podcast on either Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please be sure to give us a rating and leave some feedback about the show. Those not only help promote the podcast, but also help promote it so that others can find our podcast a little bit easier. Additionally, don't forget to spread the word about the Churchosity podcast. Be sure to tell a friend to tell a friend what we're doing here. Yeah, let them be part of the conversation too. But always remember that the goal of our instruction is love. From a pure heart. And from a good conscience. And a sincere faith. So we thank you all once again for listening, and we'll catch you next time on another episode of the Churchosity Podcast. Peace.